I began a series of messages on a word for all ages. Meaning that it's a word for all ages of individuals. Our emphasis, though, in June and July is on children's ministries and also uh, youth ministries. As you see from the bulletin this morning, you found that our high attendance day in VBS, we had 141 children and 87 workers. That means 228 people in-house on the highest of days. And, And not only that, but why do you do that? Why? Because there were six that gave their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise the Lord for that. This week we have 15 teens and three workers at World Changers in Houston helping those that lost uh, some of their their houses, some of the working on houses that Harvey hit at times last year. And so uh, they're over there working this week. And we need to pray for them that it would rain all the time over there so that it would wash out the humidity in the air and so that uh, somehow they'll cool off, somehow they'll get wet. Because, oh, excuse me, they're going to be on the inside, so it might be that they have to um, uh, take a shower or something. But anyway, we need to pray for them. And at the end of the service, you're going to find those that are going to be on junior high mission team this week, and we're going to pray for them also. With that emphasis, I have chosen passages from those passages that are customarily used as children's messages. Or that we sometimes use that way. I use a lot in children's ministries. But yet we realize there's also an adult message and a children's message there. We looked at Zacchaeus. We looked at Jonah. And today there's going to be maybe what is termed, what I term, a triple treat today. It's kind of like three scoops of raisins. Okay? Children message. Adult message. Father's Day message. So this must be, if you ask me, Dr. Edge, this must be a roaring message. You might even say, well, maybe we will name it something like uh, Man in a Den of Danger. Or God Stops the Mouths of Lions. Yes, you probably guessed it. I entitled this message, Man Among Men, found in Daniel, the sixth chapter. Uh, page 600 in that pew Bible, or page 469. Daniel in the lion's den is one of those favorites of all of us, as far as uh, in, our, uh, in our study of the Word of God. And so I want those that you that are, are first, in, first grade through sixth grade, if you'll come here, just I want you to just, you that are children, first through six. I want you to come, come down and come down where I am. This is for your children's. Uh, show you there is a children's message here. Y'all come on down. Sit down with me for just a minute. All right. Now, some of them got so tired in baby VBS that they, they decided not to come this morning. Probably their, their parents got so tired that they couldn't come this morning. So, uh, all right, I'm wait, I'll wait for you. Now, now y'all can come in a little bit closer if you want to. I won't bite. Y'all come on in. Come here and sit right up here. And maybe one over here. Okay? This morning I'm going to talk on Daniel and the lion's den. Have y'all know that story? Yeah, yeah, you kind of know that story, don't you? He, Daniel, uh, stood for the Lord and he had to pay a price for it. Put him in jail. Put him in the, in the lion's den. And... Uh, And so there's going to be some times in your life that you know you're going to be asked to stand for the Lord or to be faithful to the Lord and no one else is going to help you. There are times that you're going to have to do that all by yourself, all alone. You know, some people think that they're, they'll tell you that they're your friends and they'll say, well, well, if you do, if you lie a little bit for me or if you cheat for me or if you do this or other, then I'll, I'll be your friend. Guess what? They're not your friend at all. And in fact, that means that sometimes you may have to stand for the Lord all by yourself. But let me tell you something, you're not by yourself. The Lord is with you and will always be with you at that point. Daniel prayed. He prayed three times a day. Y'all pray. 
Y'all pray? Yeah. When you go to sleep, y'all pray? Sometimes at night, y'all pray? When you get up in the morning, Lord, thank you for the good night. When you eat, I bet you always pray, don't you? Thank you for the food. But you know you can pray by yourself at any time. Wherever you are. Lord, help me with this test. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, they can't stop you for saying that. Can't stop you from, from praying that. So I'm going to encourage you. Always be uh, boys and girls of prayer that pray to the Lord and allow Him to help you get through all those decisions that sometimes you have to make. Okay? And guess what God's going to do? He's going to throw His arms around you and He's going to help you through each one of those times. Okay? Now, let's stand up for just a moment. Y'all come on around. Let's have a word of prayer for you. Okay? Come on. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come to you today. And yes, Heavenly Father, we realize that there will be times in these children's life that, Lord, when they stand for you, they may stand alone. But Heavenly Father, we realize, Lord God, that even if that happens, there's always going to be someone around them that appreciates what they do, that honors what they do, because you've put them there. And Lord God, I know that in all times, you're going to be over them, and you're going to watch over them, and you'll be standing with them. Heavenly Father, bless them in their walk with you. We thank you for your purpose in, their, in mind for each and every one of them, and help us as a church to help them learn more of you and all that they do. And we'll praise you and thank you for that. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Daniel in the lion's den is not only a message for children, it's also a message for adults. Daniel... We call it a man among men. We could have called it uh, also uh, women. We're not leaving you out. Women among women, or teen among teens, or children among children. His faith in the living God, his trust in the living God, his walk with the living God made him one that stood out, to stand out, to stand above all the others. That Daniel becomes the example for all men, comes the example of all women, becomes the example of all teenagers, and becomes the example of all children. One person put it this way. We stand tallest and strongest on our knees. And that's how Daniel lived his life. If you think about it, it was on his knees before God that he was raised and he stands the tallest and the strongest in that, in that kingdom. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that our greatest moments are on our knees before God, not somehow telling God what to do. And Daniel knew that. And so I want us to read verses 1 through 4 first. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors of whom Daniel was one that the satraps might uh, give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the entire whole realm. That means that he became a person above all the other, all because of his excellent spirit and his uh, belief in the Lord. Daniel had been under the Babylonian kingdom. And kings. Now he was under Darius, the king of the Medes and the Persians. You'll remember that the last night that that Babylonian kingdom was in existence, one Belshazzar was the king. And he sat there and he saw handwriting on the wall. Mini mini tikul ufarsen. He said, What does this mean? And so he called, called and Daniel came and told him that he'd been uh, uh, held in the balance and his kingdom would be taken from him. That night the Medes took over Babylon. They thought they were uh, completely uh, def such defense against anyone else. They thought they would, would live forever as a, as a kingdom. They built a huge city 
They had walls, huge walls and huge gates. But they had one little problem. There was a river that came under one of the, one of the walls. And the Medes stopped the water and walked underneath the wall, opened the gates, and let them come in. And that night, not only was Belshazzar killed, but the kingdom was then in the hands of the Medes and the Persians. And Daniel distinguished himself, not only among the Babylonians, but also the Medes and the Persians. Daniel served Darius. Darius divided the kingdom in those 120 areas. He put a, 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 a person in charge of all of those. He put three governors over all of them. And Daniel was one of them. And eventually he was thinking that Daniel might even be above all the other three. That he would be right under the king because he was such a important and, and yes, he knew what to do. He might be appointed over the entire kingdom. They knew, now listen to me, they knew Daniel believed in God. They knew that he prayed, that he served the Lord. There was no, no question in their minds, this is what this Daniel does. And yet, he was still going to be put over the entire kingdom by King Darius. He knew he was. Daniel, first of all, was a man of faith. That's in those verses 1 through 4. I want you to notice what that scripture says about Daniel. Little known fact about this, and that is, is that that particular chapter in the book of Daniel, along with a few others, is actually written in Aramaic. That's different from Hebrew, okay? It's the, the same Hebrew script, but a different language. That's what it was all about. And so when someone wrote in Aramaic, it probably was someone from the government, someone from the kingdom that was doing that, writing about Daniel, and telling about him and who he was and who he was. He was a distinguished man and, and the reasons why that he would set himself apart. It was because it was written in that language. It's kind of like Spanish and French and German and English and Italian and Portuguese all written in the same alphabet. And there's only one of those that I know. That's what happens in the same alphabet for this Aramaic language. Why is that so important? Daniel is quoting a document written by Persian government officials about himself. How does it describe Daniel? First of all, it says he had an excellent spirit. My guess, he had peace in his spirit. He had integrity. He had an encourager. He was a strong character. They knew where he stood, and they knew what he believed in. They knew he would not compromise. They knew he was faithful and loyal to the king. They knew all about, he knew that he had a godly spirit that everyone saw that he lived out, was lived out in Daniel, and everyone knew it. Fathers, I'm going to ask you a question. Mothers, I'm going to ask you a question. Teens, I'm going to ask you a question. Children, I'm going to ask you a question. Is that the same type of spirit that you live as well? that excellent spirit that Daniel had. He also was faithful. Daniel was a faithful individual, faithful to the king, faithful to the kingdom of which he worked in, but more than anything else, he was faithful to the Lord God. And they saw it and they knew it. That's what you call a wow moment. Did you know that? You see this person live for God and God does amazing things through him and what happens? You stand back and say, wow! That's amazing. It should be amazing in every Christian's life that that's what happens. Every man's life, that's what should happen. It should be a wow moment that God will use you because you are faithful to the Lord God Almighty. And yes, there are times that you and I have wow moments. Sometimes they may be far and in between. But I would pray that they would become le less room in between, more wows and more moments, living God's principle out in your life. If we are all honest together, not all, of, not all of us are real faithful in all the time. We slip up. You know what we call that? We sin. We let stress take over us. Somehow we, we take it out on God. We drive out and take it out on God of what God's doing, or we take it out on a spouse and understand something. You don't have the right to do that. Spouse, I'm going to lift you up right now. Husbands, you don't have the right to take it out on your spouse. Period. Okay? Understand that. You don't have the right to take it out on your children. You don't even have the right to take it out on your dog. Okay? 
kick the dog or whatever. Shame on you as dads if you take out your stress and what's happening in your life on someone in your family. Because God is a Christian, as a dad, you should be able to go to the Lord God alone and talk with him and get that straightened out before God and not to be taken out on someone around you. He was also faultless. That is, this is astounding. They found no fault in Daniel. He did not make mistakes at work. He did not shave corners at work. He did not somehow steal the paper clips at work. He did not take a bribe either. He did not tell lies. He did not cheat for his own advancement. He was that type of guy that the Lord God, if whatever the Lord wanted to do with him, he was going to allow him to do it, and God would do it without his help. Listen to me very much. Just a minute. Christian fathers, fathers, you should be the very best at everything you do. You should be the best employers. That means that everybody underneath you and the people that you're in control of that absolutely are treated equally above all, every one of them. That somehow you don't, just because you're a boss, doesn't mean that you can go and, and, uh, 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 and holler and scream at them for whatever the reason. You're the employer. You're a Christian employer. Treat them so. Christian fathers, you ought to be the very best employee that the company has. You're always there on time. You do your work above everyone else. And yes, that's what God expects of us to do. Work. If we're workers and volunteers, then understand something. That we ought to be the very best volunteers. Dads, you ought to be the very best dad that you can be. With your children and with uh, absolutely. If they're in need or they need something or they need to, to come and talk with you about something, there ought to be a line of opportunity and communication there that can be there between you and a child to help them understand, to help them know what to do, and yes, to raise them in the way that God wants the, you to be, them to be raised. You ought to be the very best dad that you can be. You ought to be the best attendee at a game of your children playing. <gasps> Uh-oh. You know, I, I go to games sometimes, you know, baseball games or whatever, and I watch, watch uh, dads. You know, we dads are real competitive, aren't we? We're more competitive than the people out on the field. You ever watch them? Umpire, what are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry. We get all the mad at a strike or somebody's called out because we think we saw it better than they did. Maybe you didn't. You ever think about that? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you ever, uh, uh, as a dad, watch the game and get a little upset at what was going on? You ever call names to the umpires? Hope not. See, Christians aren't supposed to do that. They're to uh, encourage their, their team to win. They ought to be the best winners. Guess what? You ought to be also the best losers as well. Sometimes people lose. Some, not everybody gets the, the, the trophy. I know a lot of people want, in this world want to tell you that everybody gets a trophy. No, they don't. Not everybody wins. Sometimes you lose. And dads, you have to be the example to your children when you win, but also when you lose. You ought to be the best husbands that you can absolutely ever be. To treat your wife as she's the queen of all queens. That she's the absolute best. Why? She's put up with you. <laughs> Women, you now, mom, you can say now, amen, I put up with him. No, I'm only, I, won't, I won't make you do that. You're going to take him out to eat anyway. But listen, we ought to be the very best husbands we can be. We have to be the best examples that our kids can, can have so that they have a chance to live. Daniel was, and he was distinguished by the Lord God in everything that he did. He was set apart from others because he was faithful to the Lord. There are, there are many examples that you could say or, or give 
uh, I don't know, I don't know all his history, but I'm told that Payne Stewart was one of those guys, a golfer. He died in a, an airplane uh, uh, accident. Many of you know the story. But I understand before he would get up and go on a tournament or the day he'd have prayer time. He sometimes would go and help give encouraging words to those around him when they, had, uh, they became a father. And yes, they had one of the sweetest funerals for Payne Stewart that was ever done, all because he was a man of God too. I'm not saying he didn't make mistakes, we all do. But sometimes you can pick out individuals that you like, that have been particularly in your field, and know that they're a man of God. And yes, you're able to... Uh, uh, Use them as an example. David also, uh, Daniel also had, was a man of trials. That's found in verses 5 through 9. The trial came something like this. They didn't like him. Some of the people didn't like him. You read those verses and, and some of the, the people in, the, in the, uh, the government did not like him. In fact, everybody, in the, the governors, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, and the advisors, all of them got against him. And they said, listen, we can't find anything against him except maybe in his walk with the Lord. Maybe that will, we can find that he does something wrong in that. Well, hello, the world wants to do exactly that. They want to find fault in you somehow in your walk with the Lord. And if they can do that, guess what they can do? They can hold that up to say, well, look at him. He must be a hypocrite and always... We're humans as well. That does not give you the right nor the, uh, I guess, the privilege to go against God. Please understand that. Only charge they could come up with was this, he would go against, walk against the Lord. That somehow in his walk with the Lord. So they played on Darius's ego. They made him a god. They said, listen, you know, for these 30 days, only they can only bow before you and petition and pray to you. That's it. They knew Daniel would not do that. They knew that it would entrap him. They knew Daniel would petition and pray to the Lord God. And they knew that when he did that, he would be thrown to the lions. The lions would have supper that night. In fact, I would guess that they probably started singing that song. Boy, we've got Daniel down. And you know, they, they went to that song from the Lion's King. The lions eat tonight. Well, I think it's sleep. But lions sleep because they're full, right? Oh, well. <laughs> Something like that. They were thrilled to death that it was going to happen. You ever have trials? Not of your own makings? So we ask the question, why does God keep us? Why doesn't God keep us from tests and trials? We have Christians ask that all the time. You know, I, I'm one of his children. Why didn't he just keep all those tests away from me? Why do trials, why do they come my way? Well, let me give you a heads up. We live in a fallen world. All of us face sufferings and heartaches because sin is in this world. Some tests and trials the Lord saves you from. Others, he allows to come into your life to strengthen and mature your faith. And even Daniel's strong faith was strengthened and, and matured more through this same trial. Daniel refused to compromise. He obeyed God and he still was tested. Daniel had an unshakable faith even through the trials and that's what we all need. And I'll admit to you, I need that same unshakable faith in the Lord God as well. God in all things that go, we go through, not only that, but Daniel was a man of prayer. Look at verses 10 through 13. Now when Daniel knew that the, written, the writing was signed and he went home and in, in his upper room with his windows open to <coughs> Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Um, I want you to notice he was a man of prayer. Now, uh, I want you to notice after the decree was signed, he went home. He opened the window so everybody could see him. 
Why? Because that was his custom. Three times a day he would kneel and pray toward Jerusalem. He prayed, and we're told in the scripture that he gave thanks. Gave thanks for what? I'm thinking, you're fixing to be thrown into the lion's den. Aren't you praying, well, Lord, uh, you know, shut the mouths, keep, keep me from being thrown in, do something that does not allow me to have to go through this trial. And here, Daniel is giving thanks to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, you're going to be with me. Whatever happens through that trial, you're going to be with me. Thank you, Lord, that one day, you know, if it's my day, then it's my day to see you face to face. Whatever that is. Thank you, Lord, that you've been with me. Thank you, Lord, that you've allowed me to be the person in, this, in the Babylonian kingdom and also the, the Medes and the Persians kingdom. All of those things. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be the person you want me to be. It was his custom. That means three times a day, 365 days out of the year. That means 1,095 times he knelt before the Lord in that, in that year. That means if he was... In his 90s when he lived, when he, until he died, or late 80s, that means 87,600 times he knelt before the Lord. I'll say that again. 87,600 times over an 80-year period, he sh knelt before God. Amen is right. And I wonder this morning, what's our prayer life like? What is our prayer life like? Daniel had a prayer life that he spent before God on his knees before God. How's your prayer life, Dad? How's your prayer life, moms? Teens, how's your prayer life? Children, how's your prayer life? Let me give you a couple of tips. Tips for a prayer life, okay? Number one, call on the Lord. You go before the Lord and you worship him right at the very moment. You call on him and worship and, and yes, come close to him. Number two, you don't worry what you say. Don't worry. Why? Because God's going to give you what to say. He already knows what you need to come before him in the first place. And yes, you don't have to somehow have a, a, a memorized prayer before God when you decide to come before the Lord God. Because he's going to instill with you, with his spirit, exactly what he wants you to pray and what he wants you to know. He wants you to remember, God is bigger than any problem. Amen? Oh, we don't even believe that. God is bigger than any problem. Amen? Ah, thank you. He is bigger than any problem. Whatever that problem is, I don't care what that problem is. We also have to pray often. Now, I thought about something. I said, okay, well, how could I put it? In? Okay, two minutes every hour for 10, mi 10 hours is what? 20 minutes, right? That's better than a five-minute prayer one time a day. Isn't it? So let's do it this way. Sometimes you got, you've been drinking a cup of coffee. Guess what you can do? You can pray for a minute or two. Pray, I don't mean, you know, go, oh, our Lord God. Just pour out your heart before him. Lord, I'm going to go through a trial today. Help me. Lord, I need your help. I need my child to have help. I need that, this person that I know of that's going through a trial with her, with her child Lord, bless them today. Bless my, my, my employer because he needs to be blessed so make sure that I get a paycheck. There's all sorts of things that you can pray for. For God, it's in your own life of what God wants you to do. And then fifth and last, armor of God comes through prayer. Men, listen to me. Ladies, listen to me. If we don't have the armor of God on us each and every day, then we are vulnerable to, to, the, to Satan and everything he throws at us. But there's no way to come. There is no way that you can get that armor without praying before God and asking him to put it on you. Why would you want to do that? Because sometimes you get away from God. And when you do, you somehow get away from God and you sin against him. Satan will tempt you to go the wrong way every time and you lose every time. Men and women, teens and children, we need an active prayer life. Lastly, I want you to notice one other thing. 
Daniel was a man of victory. It's found in verses 14 through 28. Again, I want to read verse 16. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. He sounds like a, you know, I don't know, an evangelist or a Christian preacher. He sounds like he may have known God. I don't know. He says, Daniel, your God's going to deliver you from these hungry lions. Your God is going to take care of you. Sometimes people, you ever get thrown to the lions? Sometimes people disagree with you. They don't, they're not on the same spiritual uh, page at times. And God shuts the mouths of lions. Then I want you to read verse 22. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. He just simply spells it out. God sent his angel. God sent his angel. And yes, then you might call, I could name this, this uh, message, angel versus lions. Angels win. I wondered what time, what kind of food did the angels give the lions? It must have been, ready for this? Angel food cake. <laughs> Whatever it was, it satisfied them. They didn't need to eat anything else. Notice, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And that's the same for every one of us. Yes, we go through life, we go through some trials, we go through some things that we don't quite understand. We go through some things that sometimes that, that have no idea why. And yet someone comes along and says, you're God. The one that you've been faithful to, the one that you prayed to, the one that you know can handle all problems, whom you serve continually, he will absolutely deliver you somehow some way. Dads, moms, teens, and children be people of faith. Dads, moms, teens, and children be people of prayer. Dads, moms, teens, and children be people of victory. And that puts you a man above men, a woman above woman, women, a teen above teens, and a child above children. Every time. Because of the Lord. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come to you this morning. And Heavenly Father, we know that, Lord God, that in all things, that there are times that all of us have come up short at times. Maybe it's because our prayer life is not as active as what it should. Maybe it's because we somehow allow trials and and testings that come our way and, and somehow we lose sight of the fact that you're bigger than all problems. Sometimes we lose sight of the goal in mind. And I pray, Heavenly Father, this morning that you would remind us that you bring us back to that moment, back to that time, back to when we absolutely realize more so than anything else that our walk with you, Heavenly Father, is more important than anything else. Whether we're dads or moms or teens or children or grandmas or grandpas or friends or uncles or aunts, it doesn't make any difference. Heavenly Father, what's more important than anything else is that we become that individual you want us to be, that we become Daniels and Daniela's in your sight. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that him, as Him an example, may we realize, Lord God, that the God we serve, regardless of what comes our way, our faith should always be in You. We trust You, for You will deliver us. And so, Heavenly Father, May each of us be very evident of that today. For it's in the precious, precious name of Jesus we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. As we stand together this morning.
Maybe there's a decision that needs to be made. Maybe it's a private one you make right where you are. Maybe it's a public one that you need to make. Or maybe it's a prayerful one that you need to make at the altar. That's between you and the Lord as we sing this morning.